Hi, everybody, and welcome back to POCUS Cases. In this month's episode, we're going to look at a young patient who had a headache and vision changes. This case is of a 26-year-old black female who comes to the emergency department after having many days and many visits to healthcare professionals with a headache. She's quite vague in how she describes the headache. She says that it might be on one side of her head one day and another side of her head another day. The severity also changes with some days being quite severe and other days being mild, but she generally says she constantly has somewhat of a low grade headache, just some days are worse than others. She's also noticed some vision changes. She says that she's getting blurry vision in both eyes and it's getting worse. But she has no neurological changes and she's able to walk, she's able to drive her car, and she's able to do all of her activities of daily living without any difficulties. The most striking part of the physical examination was her vision. Her visual acuity is quite poor. In her left eye, she can only see the big E. In the right eye, she can only read the second line of the F and the P. All of the lines on the Snell chart were not visible for this patient. She went to a doctor earlier in the day, and the doctor wrote this note indicating that they recommended the patient get a CT scan of the head. The patient consented to a CT scan of the head. She was told by the doctor who sent her to the emergency department that a CT scan of the head would be able to find anything that was wrong with her. The doctor also told her that would rule out all of the pathology that were concerning for this patient. She was told that if there's tumors, they'd be able to see it, and if there's any cause of her headache and vision changes, that a CT scan of the head would find the answer. I went back to chat with the patient after the CT scan, and I told her that the radiologist looked through the CT scan of her head and told me that the CT scan was normal. I relayed this information to the patient, and the patient asks, well, what now? I can sense the frustration in this patient. This was a patient who's been to multiple healthcare professionals and was told that there was no cause that they could identify for her symptoms. The patient was getting worse and was told that the CT scan would find all the answers that she would need. After chatting with her some more, I zoned in more on the eyes. I figured that doing a good eye exam might lead to some answers. Now, I don't know how good you guys are with the eye exam, but I'm not the greatest with fundoscopy. In fact, now I use my ultrasound skills in lieu of fundoscopy because my fundoscopy skills are so poor. And I know what some of you guys are saying at home. You guys are saying, oh, I have great fundoscopy skills. I can always detect things like papilledema. I can always talk about cup to disc ratio size. And for those of you out there that are really good at fundoscopy, I'm gonna challenge you with this little quiz. What do you guys think in this case? Do you guys see papilledema in this case? And how about if I move my fundoscopy light over in this area here? Because I mean, we don't really dilate eyes in the emergency department, and if you work in a site that does dilate eyes, it does add quite a lengthy stay to your patient's stay, as it does take some time for the eyes to dilate, and then there's a question about whether they can drive home or not. So dilating eyes is not something we routinely do at my sites. So we just get this small area that we can use to determine if a patient has papilledema or not. So if you're at home and you said, no, there is no papilledema, well, you'd be wrong in this case. And for those of you celebrating said, I knew there was papilledema all along, well, you're wrong too, because the reality is, this is a picture of a patient's colon and there was no papilledema. In fact, it's not even an eye. So that's part of the reason why I use eye ultrasound to help me determine if the patient has any pathology. Let's go through normal eye ultrasounds. Before we even get started, I just want, to get, want everyone to know to set up the proper eye ultrasound. You would use the linear probe Placing the probe over the eye, you want to ensure that there's a tegaderm over the eye with the eyelid closed, and you want to put plenty of ultrasound gel onto the tegaderm so that you're not putting any pressure on the eye. So in this case, we'd have a tegaderm over the patient's eye. We'd put plenty of gel on the patient. If you get the patient to lie down, that would be ideal. And you would gently place the probe floating on the gel over top of the eyeball. 
and you'd be able to image the eye as you see. Just to point out some of the anatomy, this circular structure here is the eyeball with the near field structure being the anterior chamber and the posterior field structure being the posterior chamber. If I can bring your eyes down to the back of the eye here, this smooth line at the back of the eye is what's gonna represent the area like the retina, for example. And then this more darker area at the back of the eye is the optic nerve area. Now let's take a look at my patient's eye. This is my patient's eye. This is, represents the right eye and this represents the left eye. If you're wondering why the pictures look so weird, well, it was shot with my BlackBerry camera as the site that I was doing this ultrasound at did not have the ability to save images. Notice here you have the posterior chamber at the back of the eye. And if you follow the back of the eye, you'll see that there's this bump here on the back of the eye. And on the other eye, you can see the same thing. It's no longer smooth like that first picture I showed you. There's a bump at the back of the eye. This represents papilledema. Also notice that at the back of the eye, where the optic nerve runs, I can measure the distance at the back of the eye. When measuring the optic nerve sheet diameter, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to measure three millimeters from the back of the eye and then horizontally across the optic nerve sheet diameter. On this image here, I have the measurements laid out. This is the first image, which is just measuring out the three millimeters. And this is measuring the optic nerve sheet diameter, which measured in this case of six millimeters in this example. Now, if you look at my patient's eye, you're gonna measure three millimeters from the back of the eye, and then you're gonna measure the horizontal line across representing the optic nerve sheath. And when I do that measurement in this case, I got my patient's measurements to be 6.4 millimeters. Now, there's many different values out there as to what normal versus abnormal is. And the exact cutoff between normal and abnormal changes depending on which article you read. Some articles say that if it's bigger than 4.8 millimeters, then it's considered abnormal. We definitely know that over 5.5 millimeters, it's abnormal, and over 6 millimeters is definitely abnormal. So in this case, 6.4 millimeters is definitely an abnormality. Now, if you're wondering, what does this represent? Well, if the optic nerve sheet diameter is dilated, it actually represents that there's increased intracranial pressure. In the setting of a patient who has a headache, vision changes and increased intracranial pressure, the next step that I wanted for the patient was to undergo a lumbar puncture to measure the opening pressures. In this case, when I measured opening pressures, it peaked at about 34 centimeters of water. So in this case, I was concerned that this patient actually had idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The bilateral papilledema helped me make that diagnosis, and then noticing that the optic nerve sheet diameter also being dilated helped me make this diagnosis. This gave me more ammunition to pull the trigger on doing a lumbar puncture in this case, and then I pay referred the patient on to neurology. When neurology assessed the patient, they completed the workup by doing both a CT venogram as well as an MR venogram to confirm that this patient didn't have a occlusion that was causing the symptoms. And when these were both negative, the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension was made. Now, something very interesting happened after this, something that I wouldn't have considered. The patient was then referred to neurosurgery. And neurosurgery wanted to help this patient out with their vision changes. They were very concerned that this 26-year-old was essentially going blind on the Snellen chart and can only read the first two lines. So neurosurgery actually did a procedure where they put in a drain into the ventricles to help drain the CSF fluid. When I went to go visit her on the ward two days later, she noted that her vision was much improved after they inserted the drain. Two words of caution when doing eye ultrasound for this purpose. The first thing is, if you apply pressure to the eye, not only does it activate a reflex that can cause patients to become bradycardic and even pass out on you, but also by pushing on the eyeball with the probe, you can actually increase the optic nerve sheath diameter by putting increased pressure on the eye. 
So it's best that you use plenty of gel and that you basically hover the probe on the gel above the eye to generate the image. Pushing on the eyeball can cause false positive assessments. Secondly, the exact number we use for optic nerve sheath diameter is still being researched. There has been many articles, including this very cleverly named, named article after the real Slim Shady, which tells you about, well, the real optic nerve sheath, please stand up, where the authors go in detail about what we're actually measuring at the back of the eye. Are you measuring the optic nerve? Are you measuring the optic nerve sheath? Can you see the optic nerve and distinguish it from the optic nerve sheath? We still do not know the exact best measurement and what's considered normal and what's considered abnormal. But I can assure you that numbers above six millimeters with the proper technique tell you that the optic nerve sheath diameter is dilated. Optic nerve sheath di diameter dilatation does correlate with intracranial pressure. And in the right setting, if there's an increased optic nerve sheath diameter, that can indicate that there's increased intracranial pressure. A few take home points. First, think IIH in patients that have headaches and vision changes. Depending on the age of the patient, this might be the most likely diagnosis to begin with. Obviously, if they're elderly, you're going to want to think of other things like giant cell arteritis, uh, as well as other things that CT scans may help you out for in terms of intracranial pathology. But in young patients with headache and vision changes, think IIH. POCUS can be very helpful to determine if there's papilledema. I personally am not very good with fundoscopy, and my go-to way of determining if there's papilledema is by using the ultrasound and doing an eye pocus. Also, while I'm there, I can measure the optic nerve sheath diameter, and as mentioned, optic nerve sheath diameter can correlate to intracranial pressure measurements in the right clinical setting. And finally, nobody knows the exact cutoff for normal optic nerve sheath diameter. Further research is needed as to what's considered normal and what's considered abnormal. What I would see is numbers that are above six millimeters are definitely abnormal as seen in our case. And as mentioned, if there's any questions at any time, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at pocuscases at gmail.com.